Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, welcome and thank you all for attending tonight's program, Journey Toward a Cure, Updates in Crohn's and Colitis Research. My name is Catherine Soto, and I am the National Manager of Education Programs at CCFA. This program is supported by a sponsorship from Jensen and Takeda. I would like to address a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. If you're having technical difficulties or prefer to listen via telephone, please reference the numbers you see on the bottom left side of your screen. After the presentation, we will open up the program for your questions. We will take as many questions as time allows, and we will take questions from webcast participants. If we're not able to take your question, our IBD Help Center can be reached Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time by calling 888-694-8872. Upon exiting today's program, you will be prompted to complete a brief program survey. We ask that you please take a few moments to provide your responses as your feedback is extremely important to us as we plan for future educational activities. I now have the pleasure of presenting our speakers for tonight's program, Dr. Eugene Yen and Dr. Robert McCabe. Dr. Eugene Yen is Clinical Director at the Center for Crohn's and Colitis at North Shore University Health System. He is Clinical Assistant Professor of Medicine for the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. He has specialty training in colon cancer prevention and the management of patients with inflammatory bowel disease. He is actively involved in research in microscopic colitis as well as Clostridium difficile infection. He leads an active research team and is also involved in clinical trials for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. He is a member of the National Scientific Advisory Committee for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America. Dr. Robert McCabe is the Medical Director at Minnesota Gastroenterology. Dr. McCabe has been active in research in the causes and treatment of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. He has authored several journal articles and book chapters dealing with the inflammatory bowel disease. His memberships include the American Gastroenterological Association, the American College of Physicians, and he is a member of the National Scientific Advisory Committee for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker for tonight's program, Dr. Eugene Yen. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. And this is, uh, uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm happy to present updates on Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis research. This is really an exciting time for those of us who, uh, um, certainly we treat inflammatory bowel disease because we have a lot more options and uh, we'll, we're going to be talking about that during today's talks. Um, I want to remind everybody of our goals of therapy for inflammatory bowel disease. I think in the past we would really just concentrate on, on a patient's symptoms and they're still very important but we're not only just trying to make our patients feel better and I think uh, uh, with, with the new therapies we're looking for more objective and meaningful endpoints. Um, those include uh, induction and maintenance of remission without the need for using steroids, um, mucosal healing, which is when you look inside uh, the bowel and it looks normal, and also decreasing complications of blockage, cancer, needing surgery. And uh, with a lot of these goals are, are, pretty, are, are, uh, are pretty ambitious and they are often difficult to achieve without biologics. Uh, we, what we know right now about the biologics, many of you who, who, are, who, who, uh, who are on therapies for IBD are on what are called anti-TNF agents or anti-tumor necrosis factor agents. Uh, the, the one that first came out was called infliximab, um, and that was FDA approved in 1997. And subsequent to that, adalimumab, sertilizumab, golimumab, and those, these go respectively uh, by Remicade, Humira, Simsia, and Symphony. Um, they really tru truly revolutionized our care of patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Uh, the, the chart on the right basically shows a lot of the trials that have, uh, have been published, and as you can see, it's, it may be difficult to see from your screens, but you know, about 50 uh, to 70 percent of people, about two-thirds of people, respond to these therapies, and this was a huge improvement for, from what we had before um, this. Uh, 
the problem with this, as you see with the last slide, is that not everybody responds. So about a third of them don't respond. And, and, and those who do respond can sometimes lose response or become intolerant to therapies. Um, some people can get uh, injection or infusion reactions. These are sort of allergic type reactions. Uh, to, to the therapy. Some people can get antibodies to these anti-TNFs, which decrease their efficacy and increase uh, uh, chances of these injection reactions. Um, and there are these uh, 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 real infection risks that, that, that concern everybody. Um, there are also very rare safety risks, so lymphoma, skin cancer, psoriasis, heart failure, and some other autoimmune conditions. So clearly, we weren't. Uh, this was not. This was not perfect. Although we we, we were we were happy with uh, the, the the progress that we made. Uh, this is a, a scientific slide, and, and certainly I don't expect everyone to understand uh, largely, truthfully, not, not a lot of doctors understand this, but um, if you can see where some of the arrows are, you can, you can see that uh, uh, this is, a, lot of the, this is a, a, a cartoon of a lot of the mechanisms of inflammation for how we get an inflamed bowel. And uh, uh, the, the first arrow that we're pointing at is, is are the anti-TNF agents, so blockage of, of TNF um, as, as it pertains to inflammation. Um, uh, many, many people have heard of some of the uh, adhesion molecules, which we'll talk about later as well. The one, uh, the one most have heard about is vetalizumab. And then um, recently approved is something called ustekinumab. So, you know, the, if anything, um, hopefully we're illustrating uh, different pathways to what we currently have, and we'll talk about those. However, we'll also talk about some of the newer pathways, um, what are called JAK inhibitors, other IL-23 blockers, uh, uh, medications that, that affect TGF-beta. So if you, if you look at this picture and you look at all the arrows, these are our new targets. And um, it's an exciting time because uh, about five years ago we had one arrow, and now we have six. So uh, if, if, if you get anything from this talk, it's that we have a lot of new targets, and that's exciting for us. So what's new with these therapies is that, again, there are a lot of different mechanisms blocking different areas of inflammation. Some targets are more specific to the bowel, um, and, and a lot of that means that some of the safety is improved. And some of these are different. Uh, they're, they're what are called small molecules, and small molecules are, um, are, are, are largely oral pills. So instead of getting a shot or an injection or an infusion, some of these are oral therapies, which is extremely exciting. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the therapies that have already been improved. We talked about, I mentioned vetalizumab before and ustekinumab, um, and some of the therapies that are currently under investigation, looking at what are called cytokines, uh, what are called JAK inhibitors, um, the SMAD7 uh, inhibitors, the S1P agonists, and others that are in development currently. And I'll, I'll go through all of these, but um, again, the message is that we have a lot of other targets now. So, uh, so the integrins, and, and the one that, that you may have heard is called vetalizumab, what they basically do is they prevent uh, the binding of the leukocytes, so the white blood cells, from binding to the endothelial surface and going into the effective tissue. So in, in this case, it's preventing the white blood cells from sticking to the, uh, uh, the bowel wall. And currently what's, what's FDA approved is uh, one called natalizumab, and this has been approved for several years now, but it's not as commonly used because of some risks of rare infection. Uh, and what's more commonly used now is something called vetalizumab. It's an, an antibody to one type of integrin. Again, it prevents binding of white blood cells to the intestine, and it's, it's specific more to the bowel, and therefore it's a lot of the safety issues were improved over our prior anti-TNF therapies. Uh, IL-23 is normally involved in the inflammatory responses to infection, but we know that it's increased in patients who have ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, three different mechanisms of inflammation. And we found this pathway um, through a lot of our genetic studies in, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, the blockade of IL-23, which is used to kinemab, which, which has already been approved for psoriasis, um, uh, has also been recently FDA approved for Crohn's disease. And we have five-year data from our psoriasis experience with no increased side effects or can of cancer or infection. Some new uh, IBT therapies on the horizon that I've mentioned before. Um, there are something, there are things called JAK inhibitors. There's, um, these are basically cytokines. So cytokines are important in activating the immune response. And oftentimes these are overly active in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease. But JAK inhibitors, they block some of this cytokine Signaling. So there's something called tofacitinib, which is already approved for rheumatoid arthritis, and they've already completed some studies in ulcerative colitis, and they, they show some promise. The other, the other benefit is that it's an oral therapy. And there's another one that's actually being studied in Crohn's disease currently called filgotinib. So this is, this is one of our exciting uh, areas of research currently. 
There's also something called SMAD7, which basically is a, uh, which is basically one of the proteins that's upregulated and increased in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease. It prevents uh, what's called TGF signaling, which basically decreases the inflammation. And, and, and the nice thing about this also is it's an oral small molecule. Mm -hmm. The other nice thing is it's, also, it's not significantly absorbed. SMAD7 is found in the ileum and the colon, um, and it's currently being studied in clinical trials for ulcerative colitis and, and Crohn's disease. So um, uh, this is one of the examples of not only an oral molecule, but also something that's more specific to the intestine. The S1P agonists, what's called sphingosine 1-phosphate, these are, um, S1P receptors are seen in lymphocytes. These are certain types of white blood cells, and these agents basically prevent these lymphocytes from exiting lymph nodes, and this thus prevent autoimmune activation. So there's currently um, one medication called fingolimod, which is a pro approved for microscopic colitis, but we're, we're looking at this in something called ozanimod, which is in, in clinical trials for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Uh, so, in, in conclusion, our new biologics give us more targets to treat inflammation. Um, in terms of what you can do, if you're not responding to conventional therapy, many of our patients are doing very, very well, and I'd encourage you to stay on uh, the current therapies that your doctor has prescribed for you. But if you're not doing well on the current conventional therapy, consider involvement in clinical trials. Uh, my institution, as well as most others, in, uh, uh, most other teaching institutions in this country are involved in clinical trials. But the good news for a lot of these clinical trials is that most of these are already FDA approved for other disease processes, usually psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis. And so a lot of doctors have a lot of real-world experience with this, and there's already a lot of safety data. So that should help a lot of people who have um, some, um, some hesitation towards these. Uh, so that concludes my portion of the presentation. Thank you for listening. And at this point, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Dr. McCabe. Hey, thank you, Dr. Yen. And it's also my pleasure to participate in this event. Uh, let's... Um, move on to the next set. So I was asked to speak about IBD pathogenesis. So what is pathogenesis? And uh, it's kind of a fancy word. Pathos comes from the Greek suffering, genesis, beginning or origin, like the book of Genesis. So uh, many researchers try to look at exactly uh, what is the underlying processes that result in the pathos, the suffering, suffering the inflammation in IBD. And so uh, people use these sorts of circle pictures quite a bit, and really what we're looking at is, a, is an interface between how our genetics program us and what we're exposed to in the environment. And our genetics uh, really, really direct our intestinal barrier, the lining of our intestines, how our immune system responds, and then generates inflammation inflammation is a sunburn basically it's heat and redness and pain and then how do our bodies repair the damage once it happens and then the environment is really how does the external environment then uh, create differences in our internal environment in our guts and this is what researchers look at uh, to try and better understand initially the goal is understanding and that may lead to treatments and cures what happens at the uh, interface between our gut and the lining of our gut, I like to think of as uh, sort of a border or a wall, which is a hot topic nowadays. And there's a few levels of what happens in our gut that researchers look at to try and understand the pathogenesis. And the, the, the first barrier is what's called innate immunity, which is, which is really simple immunity at the lining of the gut uh, I think of it as the wall. It just sort of uh, very crudely differentiates who gets in and who doesn't. So somebody with red hair gets across, somebody with green hair does not. Um, these are uh, both the mechanical barrier, the wall, and just simple responses to differences in um, characteristics of bacteria and other things in the gut. This may be actually underactive in IBD. And then uh, the next level is the very sophisticated immune system. I think of this as the immigration and customs. This is like fingerprinting and computer databases. And the immune system gets very sophisticated with what are called T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes and, and uh, uh, recognition of very subtle 
um, details in uh, materials and bacteria that get through. Um, this may be overreactive in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Then what happens is that immune system may trigger inflammation. That's, um, that's what happens when you have a sunburn. This is sort of the enforcement. Um, this is what clears the, um, the abnormal bacteria from, that have gotten across or maybe even normal bacteria. Um, a weak inflammatory reaction may allow infections to progress, but an overreaction um, of this enforcement mechanism may result in, in self-damage. So if you, if you blow up too many bombs at the border, um, you're going to damage yourself as well. And then you need to repair the damage once it, once it happens, and there may be differences in how um, inflamed tissue is repaired between uh, people with IBD or other inflammatory disorders and people that don't have such disorders. So genetics, gene, genetics is really the genes and the DNA that codes for our body's protein structure. Um, we turn DNA into RNA, which is turned into protein. That, those are the building blocks of our bodies. And there are mutations or mistakes in the DNA code that can result in a malfunctioning protein. And um, we first began to learn that genetics was important because of observations with twins and families where there were clusters of IBD. And there have been many genetic studies, and much of this has been supported by um, IBD or by the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America funding. And I must say there's been remarkable cooperation among IBD researchers to get together and rather than be competitive, really um, uh, join hands to look for uh, genetic clues and what might be causing Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And I've just listed some things that I pulled from the most recent um, National GI meeting. Um, and it's a lot of numbers and letters, but these are um, uh, genes that code for certain proteins in the first the innate immune system, the more fancy adaptive immune system, and then the inflammatory response. And these researchers have found abnormalities in these genes that are clues uh, to why the inflammation in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis might fester. Then there's the environment. So we've talked about genetics a little bit, and, and there may be abnormal genes that lead to either under or over responses of different parts of the immune system. But what's it responding to? And just observations over the years have led to some understanding and also speculation about what in the environment might increase our risk for Crohn's and UC. There's something about living in a clean environment that seems to be a risk. Countries that used to never have anybody with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's now do, and that's thought to perhaps be uh, related to increased hygiene, cleaner environments. Um, smoking clearly worsens Crohn's. Uh, uh, Quitting smoking actually seems to make ulcerative colitis worse in certain situations. Uh, Anti-inflammatories worsen uh, both Crohn's and UC. It's very interesting that if you have an appendectomy for appendicitis in your youth, you are at significantly decreased risk of developing ulcerative colitis. So that's uh, sort of environment affecting our immune system. Uh, obesity may worsen the course of Crohn's. Um, there's a lot of concern about excess antibiotics, particularly as we're growing up. Um, medicinal antibiotics and maybe even antibiotics in the food chain uh, changing the bacteria in our gut um, in not the right way. Uh, diet, uh, I, I pulled a couple of these again. These are just references from uh, the recent National GI meeting where if there's more accumulating um, information that diet may be a factor, particularly in the risk of developing uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Uh, fruit consumption can modify gut composition in a good way. A Western diet, uh, high sugar, high simple carbs, may shift, again, our gut bacteria in a certain way that may aggravate inflammatory responses. And this is really a very hot area of mainstream research. Um, supported a, quite a bit by the CCFA, 
to try and understand these interactions with the bacteria in our gut. So this brings us to what now is called the microbiome. And this is really the population of bacteria in our intestines, which is very complex and very hard to study until the last 10 years when researchers, researchers developed genetic techniques to categorize what bacteria are present in the intestines. And the observations include that a cleaner Western hygiene, a cleaner Western hygiene and maybe Western diet um, we have fewer parasites and gut infections, so our immune system may um, have a different sort of set point because we're not exposed to those infections in childhood. And this may somehow change immune regulation, not being exposed to those infections. A, a Western diet, <clears throat> high sugar, high simple carbs, etc., may result in a less diverse microbiome. Of course, we're all exposed to more antibiotics growing up than people in third world countries, and that affects this uh, microbiome makeup. And we, we have seen that then that the bacterial composition, the microbiome of people with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis is less diverse. It's more simplified. And we also see that even in first degree relatives of Crohn's patients, um, they have an abnormal bacterial microbi microbiome. Um, and the more inflammation that is found, even if it's subtle and not causing symptoms or disease, seems to be correlated with changes in this microbiome. And how this interacts with the genetics-driven immune responses is, is really um, an area of a lot of research. So the question with all of this a little bit is, what's the chicken and what's the egg? Uh, is the microbiome less diverse because we have Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? Or do we have Crohn's or ulcerative colitis because we, we, the environment has resulted in um, uh, less diversity in this bacterial makeup? The immune system, which is driven by, the, by uh, our genetics, um, again, we're seeing maybe an impaired mechanical intestinal barrier, the wall, if you will. Um, uh, there is uh, signs of decreased immune regulation. so. Um, the uh, factors that are supposed to dampen or control the immune system from overreacting. Uh, we found abnormalities there. Um, and there is uh, evidence of increased inflammatory proteins, the most obvious one being TNF, which is the target of infliximab and the other anti-TNF treatments that Dr. Yen discussed. And this is a cartoon similar to the one Dr. Yen uh, showed, and uh, immunologists love these kind of uh, cartoons. The, the very top is the intestine with the bacteria, and then you see these tall, what are called villi, kind of protruding up towards the top of the slide. Um, those are the villi in the small intestine. And there are a few immune cells, the blue cells down at the bottom of the picture. And uh, Researchers have really dove into this to try and understand every little niche in these processes, both along the wall, that the lining of the intestine and the immune reactions that go on underneath, and then try to understand what's happening when the intestine um, gets sick or inflamed. And you can see a lot more blue cells here. If you look at the top and where the lining of the inside of the gut is, you don't see those tall or villi of the small intestine. They've flattened out because it's not healthy anymore. And researchers tend to focus on individual compartments of what's going on here. And study of these, as Dr. Yen pointed out, has really led to all the evolution of multiple treatments, which we have now. In the olden days, uh, we just tried medicines like uh, prednisone and azathioprine and 6-MP and sulfasalazine, just, just, just tried them to see if they might work. Uh, what we have now is much more intelligent and really comes from a multitude of researchers studying all these little steps that you see in these pictures. So with that, I'd like to jump way ahead and talk about clinical trials. And um, most of the clinical trials now really evolve from what was going on in that last slide and what researchers have 
been able to understand about the processes involved in these immune and inflammatory uh, reactions. And um, so what is a clinical trial? And there, there are many kinds of researchers, basic research where you uh, use test tubes in animals. There are um, clini there is clinical research where we just look at outcomes. We look at a large population of, of people and see what happens. And then there's a clinical trial, which is a specific um, study of whether a treatment works. Um, it is a medical research study in human volunteers with risks and benefits to potentially improve health. And a clinical trial is not the same as standard treatment or routine care. So why do we need clinical research? The goals are to test medical interventions, such as experimental medications, find ways to prevent disease, and find ways to improve diagnosis. And how do clinical trials work? Again, this is not standard treatment where your doctor discusses with you a couple of treatment options and you choose it and move forward. Um, these are research trials. And most of the, the treatments we have available now are available because um, people with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis participated in clinical trials which proved that the treatments works, worked and led to their availability. So trials tend to be uh, the, the big later stage trials of treatments uh, are what we call randomized double-blind placebo trials. Randomized is that usually there are two or more treatments assigned by chance, and they're blinded in that uh, uh, the subject, the participant, may get either a treatment or a placebo, a sugar pill, for instance, and neither the participant, the patient, or the physician investigator knows which one they are getting. Um, and that's the point of the placebo. It's an, it's an inactive product that resembles the study treatment, either a pill or an infusion. Um, and in order to prove that the treatment actually works, um, this is how most trials are designed. Roles in clinical research, there are a number of people that are involved in clinical research trials. Um, the study volunteer is the subject, usually a patient with a certain disease. Um, the principal investigator uh, is typically the lead physician at a site that is involved in organizing and supervising the study activities. There are clinical research coordinators. And I can tell you that I've worked with many research coordinators over the years, and they tend to be remarkably talented, dedicated, ethical um, uh, staff. Um, uh, all clinical trials must be reviewed by what's called an institutional review board, and that is an independent board that reviews the trial um, and will render an opinion on whether the risks of the trial are warranted um, in light of the potential benefit of the treatment. And the FDA in this country supervises all clinical trials. All people involved in a trial, the principal investigators and the clinical research coordinators, must go through uh, detailed, pretty rigorous uh, ethics uh, education before they can participate. Is clinical research safe? Uh, there's risks to everything. Uh, uh, every day we get in our car and do a little risk assessment analysis if getting where we need to go is worth the risk of driving there. Um, there are some risks of all the treatments we use as well as research treatments. Um, uh, in a research trial, uh, people, participates or participants are monitored very closely. And again, the trial has to pass through uh, institutional review boards and uh, these other uh, monitoring uh, bodies, uh, such as the OHRP, FDA, and data and safety monitoring boards that monitor specific trials outcomes. If something is going awry, uh, they can stop the trial early if there are too many side effects. And occasionally, a research trial will be stopped early because the treatment appears to be so effective 
it doesn't make sense to keep enrolling more subjects and keep it going longer. It's best to just move on and try and make the treatment available. What you don't know can hurt you. Risks are hard to predict. If you're considering participating in a clinical trial, uh, the more you know, the better. Um, get input from the study staff, from your doctor that's not participating in the trial, and from family and friends. Uh, always make sure that you have been advised of your options uh, for treatments, both within a trial and without. And be sure that the trial staff um, gives you adequate time to review all the information um, and discuss it with uh, your family and friends. Um, if you want to know more, uh, the CCFA website has a registry of clinical trials that are available that's interesting to peruse even if you're not ready to participate in a trial. Um, uh, ask lots of questions about how does this affect your care. Um, uh, what about personal plans? Are you going to move out of state, out of the country? Is pregnancy part of your plan in the near future? Um, What's the time involvement? Do you get compensated for any of your time? Get to know the research staff. Um, and uh, uh, just with usual uh, management of your own IBD, the more you know, the better. So with that, um, uh, we'll move on to Catherine, who I think will uh, discuss CCFA partners. Thank you, Dr. McCain. Thank you both, actually, for such an informative presentation. And now it is time for uh, the question and answer session. But before we do, as uh, relevant to the discussion of being involved in CCFA research and research in general, I wanted to point out um, that uh, we have CCFA partners. It is a great way to be involved in Internet-based research. By filling out a short survey twice a year, patients can have an active role in the research process. But CCFA Partners is more than a survey. You will also have access to tracking tools and a community of thousands to help you manage uh, your own health. You can participate in groundbreaking research, propose, discuss, and vote on research questions and topics, connect your mobile health apps to better manage your disease, um, all this you can do by visiting www.ccfapartners.org. Um, you can visit that website for more information. So now it is time for our question and answer session. Uh, I want to uh, make sure that for everyone's benefit, we please keep your questions general and uh, related to the topic of research. And you're always welcome to contact the IBD Help Center if you have other questions. If you're joining us via web, simply click on uh, question and type in your question, then hit the submit button. Um, so our first question uh, comes from Elizabeth, and she asks, uh, what is the uh, what are current uh, research on probiotics in Crohn's disease? Uh, I, I guess I can answer that. I, I think the... Um, there have been numerous probiotics looked, looked at in Crohn's disease. Unfortunately, there have not been really good results with the probiotic trials in Crohn's disease. Um, the probiotics have also been looked at in ulcerative colitis. Unfortunately, they were mostly studied. Keep in mind, most, most of the probiotic studies were done in very mild patients. So if you're a patient who has, let's say, moderate to severe disease and you're talking about being on a uh, biologic therapy, oftentimes there's just no research that, would, that suggests that. So... Um, the studies that were done mostly in probiotics were for maintenance of remission. In other words, patients were doing well, and uh, they were given probiotics to see if you can prevent getting a flare-up. We don't really have good data for people who are not doing very well, who are on biologics, who want to see if the probiotics work or not for that, unfortunately. Great. Thank you. We have another question from uh, Catherine, and she asks, are there studies looking at any way to reduce the immunogenicity of biologics? And uh, this is a savvy patient, so if you could explain to us what immunogenicity means. Um, any, any one of you, can, if you can answer. I can take it unless you want to. Go ahead, Robert. Um, I guess I'd say I'd 
the short I'd say yes and there's a lot of work looking at uh, I would say there I'd say yes two things one there's much research on using a second medication with a biologic to decrease the immunogenicity which is the biologic treatment like Remicade or Umera stimulating the immune system the second is developing biologics that are less immunogenetic that are less foreign appearing has been part of the process and third there's a goal to develop treatments such as Dr. Yen spoke of that are not proteins but are small non-protein molecules that are less likely to cause an immune or allergic reaction yeah, so Dr. McCabe was when 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 he was talking about immunogenicity, the, the term immunogenicity just um, basically, um, for for our purposes, means more having antibodies to um, a certain therapy. So um, the term immunogenicity was mostly um, for the towards the anti TNF agents like Remicade and Humira, for example. Um, your doctors may have checked to see if you have grown antibodies to these medications, and antibodies to these medications or immunogenicity um, uh, would decrease its efficacy. And so there's great efforts to try to decrease the immunogenicity. Um, we used to do dose infliximab or Remicade um, on an as-needed basis. So you would get your three doses of um, Remicade and then stop those medications, and then we wait for you to get sick again and then give you Remicade again, and we found out that was that would cause a lot of immunogenicity. So one of the safer ways or approaches to doing it is is getting doing these therapies regularly, and it's a safer way of doing this. Um, and so uh, w the the research that's been done mostly has been looking at second agents, as Dr. McCabe mentioned, as combination agents, but also making sure that you're taking your medications on a timely basis. Great. Thank you both for that answer. We have another question from Karen who asks, can the overuse of antibiotics as a child harm the gut to allow IBD to occur? Um, I, I think it's a really important question. Um, you know, we, we do notice that, uh, um, that we see inflammatory bowel disease in more developed nations, um, and perhaps that's from antibiotic usage as a child. Um, and and, and um, we also know that people who get inflammatory bowel disease have something called dysbiosis. This is the microbiome discussion that Dr. McCabe discussed. Um, dysbiosis basically means that your bacterial environment in the bowel is a little bit different than people who don't have inflammatory bowel disease. Although we don't understand if people have dysbiosis because they have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or if they have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, which causes a dysbiosis. So I, I, think, um, I, I think it's certainly a very good and interesting question, something that we don't really understand very well. Um, uh, but, uh, but I think there are a lot of people that consider the, the use of early antibiotics causing a dysbiosis, causing a lot of other types of autoimmune conditions. But I think... Um, well, the more we learn about the microbiome, I think the less we know about it, and I think uh, um, the more we learn about it, I think the the, um, the more we understand how complicated it is. So I, I think it's a it, that that's probably the best answer I could give with that. As, as somebody who looks at the microbiome a lot, I think it's a it's a challenging question. Great, thank you. We have another question from uh, Jack who asks. What stage are these medications in as it relates to clinical research? So I'm assuming this uh, caller or uh, participant is referring to the medications that you had said were in the pipeline. Robert, do you want to take that? Oh, well, yeah, I can. Okay. The treatments Dr. Yen spoke about really range from uh, from infliximab or Remicade, which was approved almost 20 years ago, to those that are in very early phases of clinical trials, and the FDA ranks those sort of phase one, phase two, phase three, and even phase four. Uh, phase four being studies that are generally done after the medication is approved and available. Phase one being strictly looking at safety and these treatments are anywhere from being fully approved to just being studied in early trials, uh, such as phase one or phase two trials. 
um, I, I would say, you know, phase three trials are main, mainly the ones that go before before they get a, approved to, to mm -hmm. you know, to give to people in general. And the phase three trials are the ones that give they give to larger groups to confirm that it's effective, but also monitor the side effects. Um, I would say the ones that are already FDA approved for other things, for other disease conditions, most of those are in phase three trials, which is a good thing, um, because if the phase three trials are successful, then um, then very 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 quickly uh, those those get you know uh, at least applications to be approved for FDA approved drugs. Great, thank you. We have a question on alternative therapy, and I wonder if you have any insights on this. Uh, relative to inflammation, what is the research on omega-3 in, in UC and Crohn's? This question comes from Manon. Um, I, I guess I can, I can answer. So the, the omega-3 fatty acids are uh, what's commonly in fish oil. Uh, has been looked at um, very significantly in, in both the ulcerative colitis and Crohn's population. The initial studies on, on fish oil were very positive, in fact, that people were, would have fewer uh, flare-ups uh, from their disease. However, there was a very, very large study that took thousands of patients in Crohn's disease um, where they did a placebo control trial. They basically gave people the omega-3 versus the a placebo or a, you know, a sugar pill. And there was no real difference in patients who had Crohn's disease um, in terms of their risk of getting a flare-up. So it was a little disappointing, but a very large trial, which basically um, showed that there was really not a big benefit to giving omega-3 fatty acids. There are certainly other potential health benefits, but from a, from a, from a treatment standpoint, um, unfortunately, I think that there's not much efficacy that's been shown for that. Um, there hasn't been a larger trial for ulcerative colitis, however, but I think that the, the, the data is very similar to that. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this question, I think, seems more uh, relevant to your talk, Dr. McCabe. Can you be in a clinical trial while you are being treated with one of the current methods? Yes, most uh, most trials allow you to continue certain medications um, while after you enter the study treatment. Um, Generally, that would not be one of the biologic treatments like Remicade or Intivio or Stellara, for instance. But often, if you are on a treatment such as uh, a mesalamine like Azacol or even an immune suppressive like azathioprine, uh, many times you continue that when you go into the clinical trial. Great, thank you. Uh, this question I open to both of you. It's from Eric, and he asks, can you comment on anti-MAP therapy, MAP therapy? Um, so I, can, I can take that, or you want to take it? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Um, so there's been a long theory that mycobacteria could even be the cause of Crohn's disease, and this is based on observation is in an animal disease called Yones, J-O-H-N-E-S. Um, most mainstream Crohn's scientists are not big believers in the mycobacterial theory. Uh, there is evidence that some people feel better when they go on combination uh, mycobacterial antibiotics. Um, but it would be listed as kind of an alternative treatment and not well established as a definitive effective treatment for Crohn's. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Yen, if you have any other comments on that. Uh, you know, I think um, there, there's this concept of, so I think the concept is there's a, there's a mycobacterium called MAP and that it's a, uh, and this is especially very common on social media outlets that um, there is there is an association with MAP and getting Crohn's disease. And if you if you treat this MAP, then um, you can sort of basically fix Crohn's disease. And unfortunately, I think a lot of these reports are very inaccurate and exaggerated. Um, my there's not really a really single study that shows that this is either true nor effective. Um, um, and you know the concept that Crohn's disease is, comes from an infection is as old as the disease itself. Um, yet there's really no successful therapy that 
or proof that that this case has occurred. In fact, you know, it's it's it, it's the opposite. So, so clinical trials that are trying to treat a purported infection um, have usually been negative. And, and we've also, and the other thing is, we also give a lot of our Crohn's patients, you know, immunosuppression. So if, if this is a if this is an infectious agent, oftentimes we would have expected people to get worse. And so I, I think certainly it's an interesting study. I think people have been talking about this for some time. I've had patients come to me asking me to put them on MAP therapy. Um, and you know, largely, I think there's certainly more research that's needed. But I, I, I think that um, uh, in terms of sort of peer-reviewed studies that have been um, on, on this therapy, unfortunately, there isn't there isn't enough good evidence that this exists. And you know, I would add that people should be cautious in abandoning their uh, established uh, IBD or especially Crohn's treatment to pursue an antibiotic reg regimen like that without a lot of real discussion with their physician and like Dr. Yen was implying, the the treatments we use for Crohn's that work the best specifically increase the risk of of mycobacterial infections. So it's it's counterintuitive that uh treatments like Remicade and Umera would work if it was really a mycobacterial uh type of infection driving the process. Thank you both. Another question we have is, are there any medications or research and development that could help regenerate tissue like the villi in the intestines? I, my answer would be that the, the, the oh. intestine has remarkable ability on its own to regenerate itself. Um, there, and if uh, the goal is to eliminate the um, inflammation and the damage primarily. Um, there are studies of of, uh, of impacting proteins that are involved in that kind of remodeling, but primarily the goal is to, to suppress the inflammation and let the lining of the intestine heal itself. There is a treatment that's uh, used occasionally for people who have shortened bowel that can stimulate the growth of villi but that's really not a treatment for Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. It's really a treatment to try and make the lining of the gut grow if people's bowel is no longer long enough. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, to keep in mind that the goals of our therapy are for what's called mucosal healing. And so um, part of that means you go back in and you sh it should look normal. And that includes the villi. And our, our, our bowels are pretty resilient. And you know, there could be lots of insult and damage to the bowel, and as long as you're treating your um, your disease process effectively, presumably those things regenerate. And we see this all the time in our own practices. That's what we shoot for when we do colonoscopies on people. We want it to look better. We want it to look normal. We want the villi to look normal. And we, we see that on biopsy, actually. So when your doctor takes biopsies of you, you're actually seeing regeneration of villi if you're tr successfully treating somebody. So, like I said earlier, that, that those are some of our new goals of therapy now, short of, you know, more so than just making you feel better. Great, thank you. We have a question from Alba who asks, how long do you recommend staying on a medication to see if it is effective in bringing a patient into remission? And Dr. Yen, we can start with you and then go to Dr. McCabe. Well, it really depends on what medication you're taking. So I, I think that uh, we usually tell people if you're on one of the immunomodulator agents, the oral medications like azathioprine or mercaptopurine, those medications often take three to four months to sort of give its best um, effects. Um, you know, same same goes with the, some of the anti-TNF agents. I would say, um, uh, you know, we're, what we're learning about a lot of these is some of them take a little bit longer. That includes Intivio for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, and so, generally speaking, I'd like to make sure that you're making some sort of small improvement slowly over the next over over the course of a few months. Um, it's it's tough. I, I think if uh, you know, we also have what's called therapeutic drug monitoring. We can see if you have antibodies or this immunogenicity we talked about. Um, but I would say that um, I would generally revisit somebody in two to three months if if they were as long as they were slowly getting better to assess if they were getting a significantly better. And sometimes there were do doctors may also do a sigmoidoscopy or some other testing or lab testing or fecal testing to see if you're, you're making some improvements. So um, I, I think it's a, it's a difficult question, but I would say on average, um, if once I start someone on a medication, I'd like to see them a few weeks later to see at least we're moving in the right direction. I think if you're making zero improvement and it's been a month or two, then I would sort of consider either doing further testing to see if it was working or not, or considering moving on to, to another therapy. 
And I would I would agree with that. Uh, that often the treatments work really well within a couple of weeks, but if they're not working great, uh, you can still get some response out to you know two or three months. So we try not to give up on a treatment too early. Great, thank you. Dr. McKay, we're going to start with you on this question. It is from Kathleen, and she asks, I'm hearing more and more about fermented foods and their benefit to IBD patients. Is there any scientific evidence that these help? No scientific evidence that I know of uh, for fermented foods. There's lots of diet information out there, and I personally used to not be much of a believer in diet impacting IBD. I'm, I'm changing, uh, I think, particularly in terms of risk for developing IBD. So I can't comment on fermented foods. Uh, I will comment that the CCFA is actually sponsoring a controlled diet study um, that will be very interesting. Uh, but there's still a lot we don't know about specifics of diet. Great, thank you. Uh, this question can be for both of you, and um, it is from Carol. Any thoughts on the efficacy of fecal transplants? Yeah, so I, I, I perform fecal transplants at my institution for recurrent C. difficile infection. Um, it's very effective for that. Um, unfortunately, I think uh, the, for the, the data for ulcerative colitis is still, um, is, is certainly not as strong, but um, I think it's still under investigation. Um, there, was, there have been a couple studies uh, looking at fecal transplant for ulcerative colitis patients um, in randomized trials where people got fecal transplant versus no fecal transplant. Um, the, the one thing we're learning about this is it's often not very durable. In other words, um, when you give somebody somebody else's stool, um, the change in the microbiome doesn't last a very long time. And so um, perhaps that's why patients don't often respond for a very long, prolonged time with this. Um, but some of the, the, the initial randomized control trials, unfortunately, were unsuccessful for fecal transplant and ulcerative colitis. Um, and I think the same is, is, is looking like that for, for Crohn's disease. I think um, the door has not been closed on this, but I, I, you know, I think we still need to learn more about fecal transplant. I think everybody who studies an autoimmune disease of any kind is looking at fecal transplant. And unfortunately, I think the, the, the data is not as strong for the, uh, um, as it is for C. diff. Um, there have actually been reports of people getting worse with fecal transplants, so this is not something we take very lightly. Is this something to try for the heck of it? So, um, while while I think it's very promising, I think it um, it still needs to be studied in more controlled fashion. And I would just add that that this is really a big uh, interest area of mainstream research, and supported by the CCFA is not specifically the fecal transplant. Um, clinical trials yet, but investigating the microbiome so that my hope would be in, in another few years, we may have really intelligent equivalents of fecal transplant where we might be able to give people, in a sense, smart probiotics that could really change things uh, for them without uh, having to take so much immune suppression. Wonderful. And we have time for one last question. I think it's a very nice way to wrap up our question and answer session. The question is, do you think there may be a cure in 10 to 20 years? I do, um, yes. <clears throat> Go ahead. You want to start, Robert? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I do. I think that the 10 to 20 years is a long time, but research, research tends to go in little steps, um, but the, the sophistication of the research is enhancing, and, and I'm optimistic that we're going to find some um, unifying defect in that lining of the intestine that, that uh, could give us a curative treatment. You know, I think... Uh you know, as 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 you could see from the talks, I, I really think that we're 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 getting we're getting very close, and I think that uh, you know we're no longer looking at just one agent; we're looking at numerous pathways. Um, you know, if you if for those of you who've had IBD for a very long time, hopefully um, those of you who've had it for a long time can appreciate the uh, large improvements we have made in the past 20 years. And my my hope is that we'll continue to make improvements of that. Um, and you know, I've been witness to that myself as well. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much to both of you for your informative talk and uh, very thorough answers to all of our questions. We really appreciate your time this evening to talk to us. Um, I want to uh, wrap up by just closing with a few uh, helpful information for our viewers. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about what CCFA offers in terms of support and services. The Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America offers a comprehensive array of services to patients and caregivers touched by inflammatory bowel diseases. The Irwin M. and Suzanne R. Rosenthal Inflammatory Bowel Disease Resource Center, or IBD Help Center, is here to provide information, support, guidance to help you manage your disease and take charge of your life. You can call or email our information specialists to ask questions, obtain helpful resources, um, and they are available Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. The information is shown below. You can also participate in local events, obtain disease-specific publications, engage via virtual education and other webcasts such as this, videos and other and social media um, to obtain more information. You should know that you're not alone and you can connect with others to uh, obtain support by participating in CCFA's peer-to-peer -peer programs. You can engage through an online community discussion groups and learning more about our Camp Oasis program for children with IBD. You can learn more about all of these programs and services by contacting our IBD Help Center at the information shown below. If you are interested in looking for fun, family-friendly activities to raise mission-critical funds for CCFA, you can sign up for our Team Challenge Half or Full Marathons, Take Steps Walks, or Spin 4 programs near you. I'd like to close by saying before exiting the program, please remember to complete the program evaluation that will be popping up on your screen shortly. Um, we really appreciate your feedback as it helps us to plan for future educational activities. We would like to again thank our sponsors Jansen and Takeda for their support of this program. On behalf of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, thank you for joining us. Good night.